Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on Forgotten Feminists. Forgotten Feminists is sponsored by The Spectator. As longest running magazine in the world, The Spectator believes that journalism must be witty and insightful, that ideas should be discussed without the constant threat of cancellation. The Spectator never confuses the serious with the dull. It isn't right wing, it isn't left wing. It believes in challenging, informing, and entertaining readers. Since its foundation in 1828, its mission has been to convey intelligence, not ideology. Sign up today and you'll receive three free months of both the print and digital magazine, plus a free spectator hat. Just use the offer code Yasmin at checkout to redeem the special offer just for listeners of Forgotten Feminists. Thanks again. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our second Forgotten Feminists. Um, today our guest is the wonderful Deb. Deb is a friend of mine who I adore um, and she also has an amazing story that I'm excited to share with you all today and I hope that you will all be comfortable enough to share your comments or ask for any questions uh, at the end of this. So, Deb, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me so much. Thanks for inviting me. So, uh, do you want to tell us all why you're in your car? Yeah. So, um, yeah, my laptop broke and my kids uh, aren't leaving me away alone. So, I'm in my car today. <laughs> As most mothers know that this is usually the peaceful spot and usually grocery shopping is like a vacation. So. Yeah. <laughs> the sad life of mothers, but yes, I totally hear you. Um, so let's take it all the way back. So you were raised Mennonite. So for those of us yep. who are not familiar, can you give us a little bit of background of what it's like to be raised as a Mennonite girl? Um, so my parents were raised very strict Mennonites, um, like Russian Mennonites. They, um, so they grew up um, in villages in Mexico where they stayed segregated and um, lived amongst themselves. Um, but uh, my parents got married here in Canada and raised us here in the city. Um, they wanted to just kind of give us a better opportunity at, at education and everything. So, um, but we still went to church and identified as Mennonites. Um, so that's, I don't know, it's just, pretty strict. I mean, women and men have their roles. They're kind of segregated in the church setting. Um, so I did grow up with that, um, I guess, just kind of ingrained in me a bit. Um, I was the only girl, so I, I just kind of identified with my mother's role in the house, um, just doing the household things. And um, so religion was just, you know, in it was just a given for me. Like the first time I came across somebody who didn't believe in God was, I think I was probably about 12 and it blew my mind. I didn't even think that was a thing. So um, religion was very much taught in the house, um, just not as strict as the way my parents were raised. So you say that you were raised in Canada, but the first person you met who didn't believe in God was you were 12 years old. So does that mean that you kind of lived in a community that was sort of separated from the rest of the greater society? Um, not too much. I think just most people were like, were Christian everywhere that we lived. Um, we lived in a city that had a lot of Mennonites as well. So it was, everybody was part of some sort of church. So it was just some, you know, everybody was part of church. And I was always part of whatever local church, not necessarily Mennonite. I just made sure I was part of some sort of community of Christians. So that, that was just who I surrounded myself with. So here you are, this good Christian girl, only interacting with other good Christian people. Tell us how things changed for you. Um, so I went to, um, after high school, I worked for a couple of years, and then I went to Bible college. Um, I wanted to, I guess, just study my religion uh, deeply. And um, I was interested in just like something like missionary work, something to do with like really um, dedicating my life to religion. So um, I went to Bible college for a year. I, um, I majored in psychology, but you have to take all the religion courses as well. 
But um, I ended up stopping uh, believing in the Bible after I started learning how the Bible was put together. Um, so it was it was like about five years of like decline after that. But I I quit um, college after a year, and then I married a man who was atheist. We were married just for four years. Um, so I had left Christianity. Um, I wasn't really atheist because I didn't know any other religions. And it was my intention to study some other religion from, you know, the other side of the world. So I was thinking, you know, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, all the, every religion I just didn't know about. So my intention was to study that. Um, I wasn't really happy where I was. I mean, I had a failed marriage. I was like, kind of like aimless at the time. And then I come across my ex, who's extremely charismatic, um, doing, uh, you know, activism for a political party and political party. And so it, it basically hit me in the face. Like he was, you know, charming, handsome, you know, tall, dark, handsome from, you know, uh, everything you would think of and the fact that, you know, he, uh, he was so uh, sincere about what he believed. Like it was very compelling. He would he would tell me like pretty bold statements about like how Islam will take over the world, and you know you're all going to have to learn Arabic. So you know you should think about being on the winning side, like that that kind of stuff. And uh, so and tackling it from a political stance um, because you know I was kind of the liberal hippie side of things and really against the war in Iraq and everything. And because uh, he was, you know, the whole propaganda, you know, on the other side of, you know, why the war was, you know, um, planned and, you know, it's, it's to stifle Islam and so Muslims won't reunite. And it was just this whole um, worldview I had never thought of before. So it was, it was exciting and intriguing and, um, I guess it just it just sucked me in. Um, we talked for about a year just through like um, emails and stuff, but um, I moved out and married him within like a few days of the decision after I just picked up and left the town I was in and we were like, okay, let's, let's get married. So it was reckless and irresponsible on my part. But um, again, I was kind of like looking at, at it like a um, kind of like it was my destiny, like God had guided me up to this point. Um, everything I had known up until now was a lie. Um, so everything he said and everything I was being taught by any Muslims that I met after that, um, I just believed it all I sucked it all in like it was just overwhelming almost so um it was uh I, like most converts that I'd met and I had a lot of friends that were converts at the time it was the same thing like because you go from not knowing anything to be told basically everything that we're raised with all our values here in the west is is the wrong thing and everything out there that we are fighting against is the right thing so now you're like switching your whole worldview so you you basically adopt almost like a whole diluted worldview because now everything that happens to you or to muslims around the world you're now giving it a, a different narrative than what everybody else uh sees so that's how I, I, I see my experience very much like being in a cult because I was not thinking the way everybody else was anymore. You weren't and what? So, what was that word, sorry? You, you weren't what as everybody else? I wasn't thinking, um, oh. you know, at, um, thinking about the world in the same way anymore. Um, you, you start looking at um, the world with like uh, as us and them, you know, like the believers and the non-believers. And it, it really, it wears on you to a point, um, like this way of life really just wore me down to nothing. 
I, um, but before we get to that, because I, I totally relate to that black and white thinking us and them stuff, but before we get there, there have been a lot of comments and a lot of questions about just the um, the perfect storm, it sounds like, because you were questioning your own faith, you were in a relationship with an atheist, you were kind of in a space where you were ripe for the picking, you know, like, it, yeah. and then this charismatic man who was so sure of himself and, you know, he just basically not just sweeps you off your feet, but also intellectually, he fulfills you with this is the answer here, I have all the answers. And so it yep. makes you feel um, it makes you feel comfortable and safe, not just within a relationship, but also, you know, intellectually, emotionally, you know, psychologically, he was fulfilling, you know, checking all the boxes for you. Yep. So if you can sort of describe to us i guess the 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 most um similar thing that i experienced to this would be when i was coerced into a marriage people just can't understand what do you mean you were forced into marriage with an al-qaeda agent how why did you do that how could you have done that and it's so hard to explain um it, it, there wasn't physically a gun to my head, but it's just right. like the, 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 the whole, you know, emotional, psychological space that you're in. And, and I know Aaliyah, who was our guest um, last Forgotten Feminist, was also trying to describe that. Mm -hmm. So if you could in some way help us to understand somebody who is a free woman born and raised in Canada, understands feminism, understands equality. How do you go from that to accepting a religion that, um, well, I guess I'm going to sort of backtrack a little bit and say that because you grew up Mennonite, you kind of maybe were primed for this as well because you were used to yep. segregation already. <laughs> you were yep. used to your mom being in the kitchen. And so you kind of, you know, you, you had all those uh, prerequisites in place. Um, but talk to us a little bit about, you said you weren't thinking, but tell us a little bit if you can remember your mindset at that time. It was a couple of days, you said it was very quick. Um, but can you go back to that time a little bit and try to tell us, you know, how did that happen? Just mostly because I, 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 I want to use you as a cautionary tale right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there are so many women that send me messages, so many mothers and cousins and sisters and brothers that send me messages saying, you know, my, my sister, my friend, my cousin, my ex, my, you know, my Y, my Z um, is in love with a Muslim man and help me. She's getting sucked yeah. in she's about to move to Pakistan or whatever it is. You know, I get all sorts of crazy stories. One Jewish woman was ready to move to Pakistan. And I was like, Oh my God, please don't do that. Please stop her from going to Islamabad. Um, so yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about your mindset there and what, if anything could have pulled you off of that trajectory you were on? Um, I think, I mean, at the time, I was very, uh, what's the word, committed to just going all in with it, like giving it a real shot. Um, again, I knew almost nothing about Islam. I didn't even know it was something you could convert to until I met him. So that's how little I knew about it. Um, so when it coming from like, you know, being free, um, these guys are very good at um, explaining that anything that's wrong in society right now is because of Western values. So this freedom is causing our destruction. This freedom is causing all the rape. This freedom is causing all the domestic violence. You know, like I've heard it so many times over the whole marriage. They're very good at, you know, everything that's wrong in society. It's because of 
Western laws and Western values, and we have don't have morals anymore. Um, and I guess coming from Mennonites, growing growing up Mennonite, I was also looking very much at that. The first time I threw on a black hijab and abaya, I immediately just saw a picture of my great grandmother back in Russia in her full Mennonite black outfit. I was like, oh my gosh, I am. I'm going right back to my root kind of thing. So again, I was looking at it like this is all you know, like my destiny. It was fate that I met this guy. Um, so there's really nothing anybody could say. Like I really, I did come across, like we would go to a, a store and the owner is a Pakistani Christian, for instance. And you imagine what he, he saw when he saw me. It's like, what are you doing? Just like this look of like, oh my God. So many times and I would have to be like, it's okay, you know, it's like try to explain why I did it, you know, and there's nothing you can say to them and there's nothing he could have said to me at the time. It was just, you're all in. Um, what could have changed me, I think if I had access to ex-Muslims or, or, you know, if the ex-Muslims become loud enough that everyone hears about us and our experiences i think i would have probably not even gone and met this guy and talked to him i would have been like no i'm not even going near that religion so i think that could have saved me i can't say for sure but that's really the only thing i can think of that can stop you know somebody from even like flirting with the idea thinking oh i'll just give it a chance it's fine like it's not a big deal ignore all the red flags you know ignore all the people trying to warn you you know, that kind of thing. Great, good, I'm glad to hear that. So we're, what we're doing today is hopefully going to be helpful for another woman who might be in that same exact situation right at the eye of the storm right now. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me about, so you put on the black hijab, you put on the black abaya, you started to feel like, okay, this is, I'm going back to my roots, I'm comfortable with this. I know that just from the experience of being a Muslim woman, you would probably, it, did it feel like a frog boiling slowly? Did you ever notice your freedoms being taken away one by one? Um, or did it just, were you too caught up with like your children and the day to day and just him being so charismatic? Was he just so good at basically hypnotizing you into this cult and not really realizing what you were in? Or were there moments of clarity where you were like, hang on a minute, why am I doing this? Or why am I saying that? Or, um, you know, were you? Yeah, yeah you, there, he was, oh, at the beginning, it was very easy to just go along with it all. I mean, I got pregnant right away, so I stopped working. So I'm just, you know, home, you know, starting a new life, right? Getting that ready, meeting only people, learning the religion, which took up a lot of time, like mm -hmm. studying Arabic, trying to memorize the Quran, trying to memorize the prayer uh, in Arabic. That kind of stuff takes up so much time and energy. Um, I was stressed out that I wanted to have so much done by the time I had the baby. So mm -hmm. I was like giving myself time to like have this much memorized and have this, I wanted to have the whole Quran read and a lot of it memorized and learning Arabic and meeting all these people and doing events with this political party. Um, it was, it went really quick. Um, we're constantly going around advocating for Islam and how Islam is what really frees people. But it's, you're going around dressed up like the way I was, uh, saying how free you are. It's really like, it's so funny. Like it's, it's basically like somebody in jail saying like, now I'm free. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do to tell them that you're in a jail cell. It's like, no, 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 this is the free spot. But like you, it's like such a mess. Very well, well yeah. Yeah. Right, like I, the day that I bought my first hijab and abaya from the store in the strip mall, right beside is a bookstore, all Islamic books. They gave me like a stack of books about women in Islam and how 
like all the rights of women. It's like, I was just bombarded with all of the beautiful, amazing things women get to do and be in Islam. So, and, and reading, so it's interesting how you can be oppressed and then just be told, no, that you're the free one, like you're yeah. free. And even like being told like, oh, if you have a beautiful diamond, don't you want to hide it away from thieves? And it's like, well, no, because most people want to show it off, but I guess it's wrong to show it off. And you're trying to like justify that stupid statement. <laughs> but yeah, so it's just honoring people by covering them up and hiding them in a way is supposed honor. I don't know. Yeah. So when you were reading those books that supposedly are telling you all about the rights that women in Islam have, I love those books because they just tell you women have all the rights women have so many rights women have yes. all the rights of the sun it's like at, <laughs> at, what point, at what point are you going to start to tell me what those rights are yeah what are they <laughs> so, no yeah. no they just keep repeating it over and over again women are like treated like queens women have everything yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. But, I, yeah i would go to i would go to halakas about um like what the wives duties are like so it'd be like a sister's halakha you know we're all studying quran and we're just learning about what and like what are the women's rights in a marriage and we were like oh look at all these rights we have and there are zero there's no books in english about what the man's rights in a marriage are but my ex had a book in arabic and he sat down and he read a couple pages to me and it was mind-blowing the difference between the rights of a man in a marriage over a woman and there's a reason that book is not translated translated in English because it would really like burn Islam to the ground because it, it was disgusting like what the man's rights were compared to the women's. It's all like in the if you just you just show the women's rights alone and you don't compare it to the man's rights like you were like okay yeah look at all the rights like you have a list but what are the men like let's look at this like they have they, they basically need to be treated like absolute kings in oh, the yeah. household and you have to do everything in your power to maintain his dignity no matter what he is even if he's the worst person doing the worst thing you have to be the woman of the house and you have to uphold his status you you lie for him you do anything to make him look good to everybody that well, is your absolute number one goal there's a hadith that muhammad said a, ma a husband could be covered in boils that are seeping pus and uh, his wife could lick him from head to toe, lick all of the pus off of his wounds, and she still wouldn't be, you know, uh, worthy of just thanking him for everything that he does for her. Like she's still yeah. going to be beneath him. There is there's nothing that a woman can do that would ever, you know, satisfy how much she owes to this man. So, you know, even when they talk about the rights of a woman, of a woman, the rights are basically it sounds like a pet. It's a dog. It's like a little chihuahua in the house. Right. Yeah. Sure. He has to feed you. <laughs> He has to clothe you, right? Things like that. But is a chihuahua allowed to walk out the door when he wants to and go wherever he wants? Of course not. Is a chihuahua allowed to express an opinion about, you know, his preference of, of you know, I'd rather sleep on the sofa than this bed that you're giving me here? Nope. That that's the the rights of a woman in Islam. It's embarrassing to read those books. It's embarrassing that they that they can somehow even call those things rights even when you're talking about the most uh basic things like the oh a woman has the right to an inheritance you know what i mean it's like half of a man's but you know yeah. she has the right to inherit as That's if we're funny. supposed to be grateful it's like the taliban in afghanistan right now they're like sure we'll let girls go to school but they have to wear niqab and they expect yeah. women to be like, oh, yay, thank you for that opportunity for allowing me to dress myself up in a body bag so that I can go to school. No, fuck you. This is not a right, you know? 
Yeah. But anyway, sorry, <laughs> let's get back to your story. Um, so we were talking a little bit about, so reading the, let's say, for example, Quran 434, where it talks about a man can beat his wife, or right. you've read the hadith about how uh, basically marital rape is sanctioned in Islam, no matter what yeah. a woman is doing, if a man wants her, she has to stop what she's doing and, and satisfy him sexually. And if she mm -hmm. doesn't, all of the angels will curse her till morning. Yeah. There are so many things like that in Islam that um, basically, you know, the hijab and the niqab are the physical restrictions, but there's all sorts of restrictions like that that really just bind you in place. So I just, I'm curious to know if you ever at some points in the marriage felt a light coming in or felt yourself questioning or doubting or thinking, did I make the right decision? Did that ever happen? Um, there was, uh, so I had tried to leave him a few years before I actually did. Um, and again, the religion was never part of me leaving him. Like that was wow. like the last thing to go. Like the religion was so embedded. I had told myself so many times that there was absolutely no way I could possibly leave Islam. I had told myself that so many, and other people, that it, it's, it's impossible to, leave the truth once I've been shown the truth, like that kind of mentality. Um, but it was when I had tried to leave him and I came back to the house, because um, I had gone to my parents, I came back to the house with my one son. Um, I had to go there for some reason and my ex was there and he, he, he just verbally told me, um, he verbally told me you're not allowed to leave the house. So like you have to obey that command from your husband. And I remember sitting there because I was trying to leave. I was trying to go back. And I remember sitting there just staring at the door. And I'm like, and he's telling me I can't leave. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I, I should just be able to get up and leave. Like, what is wrong with this scenario? Like, it was so wrong. Like in my soul, I was like, I was like, I was in my, I was mentally going out the door, but physically I was stuck there I was like frozen and it was this it was so agonizing and, and I had and I just I stayed and the worst part was to call my mother and lie about why I'm staying so this hold that he had on me that was one instance where I was like hold on here this is not right like this, I, I don't know what it is about the scenario that's not right, but there's something not right here. And I couldn't even place my finger on it. It was, it was so hard to describe to other people. And I couldn't even see that as abuse at the time. But um, there, there was just things like that where it's just, and knowing that our goal was to do Hydra and all of us, we were going to end up in the Middle East um, with his second wife and her kids. We were all going to go out to establish the Islamic State somewhere. So knowing these type of things that he enforced on me were going to increase a hundred percent. Like going there, like I would be trapped as a woman in that society, not just my household being an Islamic household. It would be much more. So this dread of of going to that was on my mind, bringing my children to that, and my two oldest or girls. And, and thinking about putting them through this and they would have to marry somebody like their dad. Um, so these things really started wearing on me, like having to enforce this way of life on these children now. So yeah. Yeah, yeah I totally get that. And you were probably being held up on a pedestal too, because you're a convert and converts are usually like trophies. <laughs> that are held up like, look how true Islam is. This woman is willing to give up all the freedoms of the West to come to the truth. Um, so did you yeah. feel that there was a lot of pressure from the rest of the cult members, rest of the Hizb Tahrir missionaries, I guess, I don't know what you would call them, Dawa people. Um, did you feel a lot of pressure to be, to fulfill that trophy that they were, you know, putting you up as? They were very much trying to make me um, kind of like part of uh, the women 
like leadership of the women of the Hizza because it's very segregated. Um, I, I fought it constantly because I had, I was constantly pregnant and breastfeeding. Um, mm. It was too, so it was just too much, but I was brought to everything. I was, um, you know, the, the, yeah, I was held up, like, look at her. Um, everywhere I went, I had to, you know, be the convert and tell why Islam is so true that I was compelled to join it. Um, yeah, it's, it, again, that, that kind of holds you into it, too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can totally see that. And so when you were talking about they were going to go somewhere or you were going to go somewhere with your kids and him to the Middle East to, to establish a caliphate, um, did ISIS and all that happen during your marriage? Yeah, so ISIS um, was starting up uh, in Iraq at the time. My ex had traveled all over um, just when they started getting big. And uh, so he... Uh, the Hizib is very aware of all these movements that go around, so they knew what their uh, inner, I guess, Akita is, like their frame, framework, their Sharia framework that they follow. And if it's not exactly what the Hizib wants, like they won't support them. So instead, they would go and try to correct them. So the Hizib did try to go to ISIS and they were arrested and, and killed by them. But uh, yeah, I mean, my ex traveled all over. He was even trying to get into Syria. A lot of the his have tried to go and work with the rebel um, factions in Syria to fight ISIS. Um, any sort of, you know, they, they want to, they want to like gain the, I guess, support of any sort of militant group or army so that they can you know overthrow a government and start their islamic state so that's how they they work that's actually really what's really great about it (laughs) is it's kind of like the um that john cleese uh you know when they were like uh what is it the the, the front of judea or judea's front or whatever like they just like a slight little different like slight little differences between yeah. them, even though they have the same goals, they want to reach them in a different way, or they have, you know, slightly different ways of, of, you know, attaining those goals. So they won't support each other. And we see that happening in Afghanistan today, where the two factions uh, of the Taliban are fighting. So there's the, the more diplomatic side of the Taliban are trying to take credit for getting the country, overthrowing the government. And then there's the more terrorist side of the Taliban that are like, no, we're the ones that get credit. Um, so it's kind of like this. So Hezbo Tahrir are the Islamists and ISIS are the jihadis. They all have the same goal. They all want to spread Islam. They all want to have a caliphate, but they all want to have it in their own specific flavor. So just get me the popcorn as they continue fighting. I'm fine with I it. Know. They just ruin it for themselves, really. Yeah, that's great. I love that Saudi and Iran hate each other. Fantastic. Continue hating each other. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> anyway, um, so let's talk a little bit about where you are today before we open up, up to questions with everybody else. So was the second wife coming in and joining your family, was that kind of the, the straw that broke the camel's back? That was, so I knew that was coming from the beginning of the marriage. He made sure I had that in mind, that he would definitely get more than one wife. So um, five years, no, seven years into the marriage, he um, found uh, her and they got married. That was probably the beginning of the end for me because I finally had him a long time. So he was at my house half the time now. So I could start. Oh, when, when you start spending for yourself more and being reliant on yourself with your kids, um, that kind of thing, it's kind of empowering. It's like, wait, like I don't need him. Like that oh. kind of. But it was like a slow progression. And I think this resentment towards him obviously he had a second wife like you can't I had to just like 
you know, push all those feelings down and pretend they weren't there. But clearly I had like resentment for him. So I slowly just lost all respect for him. Um, the fact that I always had to lie for him to make him look good, like you just lose, res like how can you respect somebody that you have to lie for all the time? Um, so it was, I was purely staying for the kid's sake and for my, my religion only to, to maintain that aspect of things. Like the kids need their dad and, you know, Islamically, this is a better thing to do. You know, he's not being a bad Muslim, so I didn't have that reason for leaving. It just burnt me out to the point where I literally almost wanted to kill myself. So it was almost like he drove me to, it drove me to a point where I was going to die at, somehow, like something bad was going to happen. So it's good. Um, I, I got out. Uh, I had some friends that helped me to go to a shelter when he wasn't letting me leave with the kids. Um, and he's still trying to enforce um, his Islamic rights on the kids. I've been fighting for custody for four years. Um, Islamically, the man gets the kids, right? Who the so fuck cares about Islamically? Like, it's, well, I find it interesting how he cites he, Islamically. He he inserts all this kind of stuff that would be in a Sharia court into court, like our court proceedings. It's really crazy. Like he'll put statements about how, you know, in our marriage, she agreed that uh, uh, in our Islamic marriage, nikah ceremony, she agreed that we would raise our kids as Muslims. And it's like, we got married in like last minute in his friend's house with some strangers. Like, I don't, I never agreed to anything about kids, <laughs> raising kids at that point. But yeah, like he's just bringing up stuff that's irrelevant completely in court here. And it's just really funny. But so yeah, so you have to fight hard because these guys will, and, and from other cases of like mine that I'm hearing, these guys really try to enforce their Islamic rights, but they don't care. They don't respect the laws here one bit, like zero. And they will go turn around and sue the lawyers and judges if they don't like, you know, how it turned out. Like, it's just really insane. But they really just don't respect the system here. And they kind of just ruin it for themselves by trying to throw their Islamic rights and impose it here. So how are the judges and lawyers responding to him? Are they, is he using the racism, Islamophobia card all the time? All the time. Yeah. He accused all the lawyers of being racist. He accused the judge of being racist. Like his lawyer, who's also Muslim, is accusing everyone of being racist. They're trying to replace all the, the counsel with other, with Muslims. It's like, well, who's racist then? <laughs> we are trying to. Who's yeah. a racist one? But yeah, it's just, it's really crazy how it's just really blatantly trying to impose their own rights. And, and the victim card doesn't work on him because he's, he's literally, a, he's, most of the Muslims in the community don't like re also reject him because he's so extreme. Like they don't, like he gives them all a bad name. So, I mean, that victim card doesn't work on him. So do you find that the court system is being supportive of you? Like, are they understanding that you need to protect your children? Are they understanding that your, you know, your children identify as, or one of your kids does, identifies as in the LGBT community. And this is yeah. a man who is actively speaking, you know, extremely viciously homophobic slurs in, uh, you know, at a, in, in public. Like he's not yeah. even, it's not like he's just saying these kinds of things at home. So yeah. with Canada being the way it is, you would expect that there would be a zero tolerance. You know, they, they would understand how important it is to protect you and, and protect your children. So I just want to know if, if his, um, his calls of racism and Islamophobia and victimhood and bigotry and all that stuff, like, are you finding that it's working? Because you know, in my situation, it did work, right? The cultural yeah. relativism, the moral relativism. Are you seeing the same thing in your situation? Or are you feeling like you're being protected by your country? Um, I was worried that 
they would side with that type of thing. Um, when when we started the process, I did see that, but they were really afraid to even say the word of them. But as they got to know who he is, the court seemed to see a lot of men like him, and they just see right through him, like right away. They see what kind of person he is. They brought up some previous cases um, to look at the precedent of how these cases are ruled. Um, there's cases almost exactly like mine um, with the converse and very extreme um, 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 ex and you know she gets all the custody and he's not even allowed to teach the kids of them. Like that's what it ends up being. So they really do recognize, especially because my ex is very, very vocal and very extreme. Like, He's very anti-government. Like every Remembrance Day, he makes videos and about um, why wearing the poppy is haram and you're honoring murderers. And um, every time it's time to vote, like now he'll be handing out leaflets in front of the mosque saying it's haram to vote because we're voting for um, a kafir and a kufr system. And he, this is just every, so it's, he's just rooting for himself. These guys just, you just have to be firm um, as a mother and, and don't, I, I started to succumb to some of his bullying and trying to like see the kids a lot over the past year and stuff. But I realized like when I really put my foot down and say, I refuse to like force them against their will anymore. Um, I have everyone backing me up because they just want to protect the kids. Yay. Like it's just all about the kids. So. Oh, I'm so happy to hear so that. I'm so thankful. And one of the, it's really funny because I, I'm always so thankful that I'm living here in Canada and I have like a whole new appreciation for living in this country. I have hated this country for many years being um, in the Hizzet. So I, I have this like crazy complex where I, I just, I absolutely love every institution here. Like I just, it's just like I think I'm just going extreme the other way right now. I went through that too. I remember feeling that yeah. way as well. Like, well, it, it really yeah. literally saves you. Like if I wasn't able to get student loans, you know, if I would, I, I would, if I wasn't able, if I wasn't in this secular, wonderful, beautiful country, there is no way I would have survived. And it's the same with you. If he had succeeded yeah. in taking you to Syria or anywhere else, like you and your kids would be fucked. Like there's no, there, there yeah. would be no way to get out. So you appreciate yeah. Western values, you appreciate secular values, because you know it literally saved your life and saved the yeah. life of each one of your children. Yes, 100%. Yeah, he even told me himself, he said, like, you would never have done this if we were in Saudi. I'm like, obviously, I wouldn't have. <laughs> just like, that's, yeah. <laughs> you're just yeah. making my point for me. Yeah, yeah. So uh, before we move on to questions from everybody that's here, I want to ask you this one question that came on Facebook because the person who's asking it uh, couldn't make it, but I promised him that I'd read it for you um, and get your response. Um, so he was kind of uh, giving his hypothesis as to why a Canadian woman would marry a Muslim man. So he says, <clears throat> I think it has a lot to do with sexual fetish and the sexual arousal of submission. Islam is all about submission. Women that convert generally have a Muslim man in their lives. Hence, the arousal is two-tiered, submitting to the dominant man sexually and what he wants, which includes conversion, and submitting and subjugating oneself to the will of Allah. Hence, a sexual fetishization of the religion itself. So I wanted to hear your perspective on that uh, two-tiered sexual fetishization, Deb. Okay. It's interesting. I, I can see where you're coming from. I mean, if you're thinking about everything in a sexual way, you could kind of read that into it. Um, yeah, I mean, the submissive woman thing was part of it for me because I did grow up in that environment. I mean, the submissive wife was something that seemed to be the right thing or just it seemed to work for so many people or just people in my life. I just want anybody, family members that I had. Um, 
the reality of being a submissive wife is nothing like, you know, this cute little scene that you picture of like a household where the man works in the woman's home and it's so nice. Um, when you give up your rights like that, um, I don't know, like, sure, like thinking about being a submissive partner sounds okay. And sure, if you're, if you like it sexually, fine. But in to commit to that for the rest of your life until you die is another story. Like it's nothing, like it's one thing, like you, it seemed really interesting and it seemed to be the right thing. But again, like it just, it wears people down. Whenever I met converts that had been in it like 20 plus years, if they hadn't left behind most of the practices by then, they had like massive resentment towards the religion or if they were really religious at that point, which was very rare, um, I don't know. It, it was just like, the religion seemed to break them after a certain while, like of really practicing it hard. And um, most people ended up just leaving it altogether. You just never see them again. But yeah, I don't know, this guy. <laughs> I guess I personally don't relate to the, I've heard it many times, um, people sort of finding comfort in submission because mm -hmm. somebody else is gonna take care of them. Yeah. Um, that terrifies me. I would never want to be in that position ever because it's giving so much control and power to another person. Yeah. And I just could never trust anybody to that extent. Um, so I think that's why I never, like, I just couldn't understand that perspective of a woman wanting to be in a submissive role. Um, but, you know, I guess it all depends on your life experiences and, and your just its nature as well as nurture, I think. Um, but and I do. It's, it's also with Islam, like you're just, you're believing it's the truth. So you're trusting that the creator knows what your role should be. So I just always had this trust that if you just submit to that role, like your life will be easy. Like you yeah. just like have this trust that God will make it good for you if you do the right thing. Yeah, that's what it they didn't tell happen, though. No, it, didn't it never happened. Happen. You, it I did it all you. the way. I did it all. I did yeah. every single thing he wanted Me to too. the absolute limit. Like I took it all the way. Yeah. There was nothing more I could do. I was covered head to toe in black. I never left the house. I was making the babies you wanted. I was getting raped like you wanted. I was getting beaten like you wanted. I everything, 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 everything. Yeah. And I, there was absolutely no happiness to be found whatsoever. So you, you, you just, that's the lie that they sell you, right? Yeah. I prayed five times a day. I prayed all of my sunnah in between. I, I did fucking every possible thing that you could possibly imagine. Every mm -hmm. moment I had in my life where I wasn't cooking or cleaning, I was reading Quran. None of it mattered. And in the end, mm -hmm. you just end up becoming an empty diminished you can't even call it a shell because there's not even a shell there's not even the shadow of a shell you're absolutely nothing in the end and that's i i like i had to take it that far before before i finally realized okay so it's a lie i had to test the theory like okay if i submit if i do everything you want will there be happiness at the end of this there is nothing but misery yeah, I got to the point where I was just wishing to die and hoping I could just rest in, in heaven. Like, that was just like, you're just hoping to be dead. Like, that's a, what kind of life is that? Yeah. It's yeah. so horrible. Yeah, my, I, I remember just recently I watched uh, a documentary about the Taliban and they were showing a woman getting flogged, uh, whipped at the end of it. And it was the first time I sat and watched one fully with the audio it was like 
it brought back a, a memory of when I was leaving my ex, leaving him, and he stood like right in front of me and told me that I need to be with like that. And he, he, he had just came back from overseas and he said he had met a man who had it done to him. And he explained to me what it feels like to be whipped a hundred times. And it was like, that was what my future was gonna be. Like I was gonna end up out there <laughs> and working towards that kind of horrific disaster of the human rights. Like, I don't understand how people can think that it's, it's like a good thing that they're doing when that is like the end result of implementing this system like it, it's bad every time it's a moral this superiority and we see it happening in our society right now too it's a moral superiority they feel like if they're whipping somebody or if they're stoning somebody it makes them more righteous because they are they are the good people and those people that it's happening to are the bad people so it's that same black and white thinking that same this is why I believe that Muhammad was probably autistic and, and OCD and probably a lot of other things on top of that too. But that black and white thinking um, yeah. and how it is so simplistic and how it, it it's so successful to indoctrinate somebody into it because it's so clean, so easy. But yeah, they just think that we're the good ones and they're the bad ones, so they're, therefore it's okay. It doesn't feel yeah. wrong to do that to a bad person. It's good to do that to a bad person. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> All right, so we're going to open it up to the group now and let everybody else have an opportunity to chat with you or ask you questions. So um, you guys can click on the reactions down there and raise your hand if you like. And then I will know to call on you. Okay, Erkan. Okay, hi. Thanks a lot. Hi, thanks, Deborah, for um, really interesting discussion again. Um, I was reading recently, I started reading Ed Hussein's book around the Marxists. I don't know if anyone else has read this book. Um, and it's about Britain, you know, where I'm from. And um, Something struck me in, in, um, in the early stages of the book. He was writing about the, um, uh, the we, we, have a very, we have a very simplistic notion in, I think, in the West of what fundamentalism is and radical is, you know? And he mentioned things like when he went to the different, the various mosques and the more extreme, um, types of mosques in different British cities. He mentioned things like, so little things like, um, so prior to the main sermon, they would refuse to use English. It would be all in Arabic, right? Um, the way that the men dress, which is even, you know, even in some Muslim countries, they don't dress that way, you know, in that, insisting on that kind of, you know, the long, I've forgotten what you call it, the long shirt and the trousers and the sandals and like a phobe or whatever sorry sorry um i've heard the word phobe used phobe is what arabs wear right. yeah yeah, yeah. So he means, our welcome yeah. is what pakistani people yeah. wear right yeah so he mentions these things and he says also that you know so in in jewish uh, you know in churches so christian churches and also sects, uh, synagogues they say something for the state of for, for the head of state as well like before the sermon begins they'll say something for Queen, for example, right? Now, there's one group of people, one group of religious people in monotheism in England who don't do that. And I think we can all guess who they are. Um, he mentions that Muslims have stopped doing that if they ever did, or some of them do anyway. And so I, I started to think that, I mean, he doesn't really, he, he, he mentions it, so I'm sure he's thinking along these lines, but he doesn't he doesn't seem to find it very remarkable. And I was thinking about that creeping kind of radicalized, it's, it's a kind of hotbed of, you know, he, he visited um, 
the, Dews, the Dewsbury Mosque and the Didsbury Mosque. The Didsbury Mosque was in Manchester, where I'm from. And he said uh, that, you know, um, he mentioned these kinds of creeping kind of, you know, more extreme kinds of behaviors. And I wonder what you think, are we really just too complacent in the West? And, and are we setting ourselves up for, you know, um, more trouble to follow by just ignoring these little signs? You know, we think that, you know, fundamentalism is strapping a bomb to yourself or putting a, a rucksack on and blowing up kids at a concert. We think that is fundamentalism, but I wonder what you think. Are we, are we too complacent? And yeah, over to you, Deborah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, a lot of these mosques, like what you're talking about, um, they won't um, they won't even let any government officials into the mosque. Some do, like you'll see, like the more moderate mosques will have like a, a members of parliament come in for different prayers for different celebrations. So they'll be like, yeah, you know, we're one of the community. But the more extreme mosques, you're right. They they're very Arabic. Um, they have almost no space for women in these mosques as well. Like they almost put them in a corner to the point where they're like, the women will just decide not to come anyway. Um, Actually, so, yeah, just, he said that the, in the in one of the, uh, I think it might be the Jewsbury Mosque in, in Yorkshire, they actually, the women don't go. They're not allowed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so crazy. Right. I've never been to a mosque where there was no spot, but I've been to mosques where there was like literally maybe enough room for three women to sit, and it's like encased in a curtain. So like you, you're just in this corner. It's really crazy. But um, so you were saying like the churches have to say something about the state before their sermon. So yeah, yeah. The, queen. the queen is head of state. Right. So I've never been to a mosque that would ever do something like that um we would always go to the more extreme ones like and to the point where even if we attended an event and somebody from the government said something we would never stand up we would never clap we weren't allowed to stand up for the national anthem like literally that the the islamic schools like the more extreme ones um they don't even play the national anthem before school so the segregation and the separatism is a real problem and when I saw that uh, Macron in France decided to let's tackle this aspect of the, the society, like how, because how do you counter extremism? Like, let's take a look at who's being like real separatist. Like, let's stop the homeschooling because I had to homeschool as well. So the, the more extreme Muslims, like they will never let their kids in government schools. Like they would rather, they would move out of the country. Like, I think we would have left Canada if we weren't allowed to homeschool um, or, you know, put them in a Islamic school. So, um, yeah, looking into the segregation like that, I think a lot of governments when it comes to um, intelligence and watching these type of mosques, I think they do watch them. It's a matter of like whatever policies there are that they can actually engage. But I think they do watch them because I know from after I left and I had all kinds of law enforcement like coming up to me and wanting to know all kinds of stuff, I realize how much they're watching anybody who's extreme. Mm. Right. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, well, yeah, it's just just reflecting on kind of similar thoughts. Yeah, you, you did. yeah thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, uh, let's move on to Lois, please. What's your question? Thank you, and thank you, Deb, for being so open with your, your experience. When you were talking about sort of your mental emotional position when you met him, it <clears throat> reminded me of a statement I heard recently about why women get drawn into bad marriages. And it hit me because it was totally true for me. The statement was, you marry at the level of your self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what you, how you thought about that. Yeah, that makes complete sense that, yeah, he picked me up right at the right, right time. I was like, I was just like putty, basically ready to just, you know, believe whatever is going on here. And then if you like tell yourself it's the right thing, then anything that goes on or happens, you just think it's all meant to be that way. It's so easy with religion to just, like just tell yourself that and just 
comfort yourself in that fact. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I believed it was the Lord's will. Right? And, and it's so easy to just like, no matter how horrible something can be that's happening to you, it's just like, well, it's meant to be, and you yeah. just take it. Right. Yeah, unfortunately. <sighs> um, Sahara, did you have a question that you wanted to say? There's a comment. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sahara the Free. I guess I didn't come Sahara the Free. I didn't uh, the name. I am so proud of you, all of you, all the survivors, all the women. I wish I knew Dabra when I was running away from Islam. You know, I came to the West and I was running away from this bullshit. And and I saw literally, yes, it's the indoctrination, is the brainwashing is the cherry picking like in the west because i seen in the university how they indoctrinate people how they brainwash people and then even i was in this event at that time i was a muslim and i will share my story of course i'm gonna have conversation with yasmin sometimes um i was at a university and this guy was literally bashing about ex-muslim like ayan my hero which i knew when i was covering islam so I remember in the university, these people come to university, the Muslim, and I don't know, maybe they were extreme, whatever, but he was um, literally had a uh, full of room, like a full people, like Western, especially not Muslims. I was the only one Muslim I was covered, but he was telling them how Islam is good, you know, how Islam gives uh, women's rights. And how, and I'm just like, I raised my hand, you guys, like I was sitting in the front and I was literally the only black woman and, and with the hijabi. So I raised my hand and this guy dismissed me because he knows what I'm gonna ask or whatever. So it's just, it's really sad to see what, what's taken in university. I don't see indoctrination happening in Christianity doing it. I don't see Buddhist or whatever, but Islam is in university, it's in education and I'm an educator. And it's really sad to see, um, you know, how Dabra, of course, ended up with this, her, you know, with the ex-husband. Um, but I'm not surprised because it's really sad. And I mean, you know, I because if you don't know what Islam is, you're just going to fall for the cherry picking and these people brainwashing people. And um, but I tried. I tried to educate when I was in university, but I've been called Islamophobia, you know, all the names. So. I am so proud of you, all of you. Uh, sorry, I'm like rumbling all over the place, but I'm proud of you. I wish I knew Dabra when I was running away because I was very rebellious. And even when I was wearing it, asking questions, a lot of things, but um, I'm proud of you. I love you guys. You are my heroes and we can fight this shit together. Mm -hmm. Love you. <laughs> Sahara is going to be my guest in an upcoming Forgotten Feminist, so we're going to hear some more of her fiery perspectives, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, Aliyah, you're next. Yep. Hi. Hello, hello, Hi. hello. Yes. So, I just wanted to know, so you left your community, the um, Mennonite community, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mennonite, so you, have, yep. so, you had left your, your community, and were you trying to find, like, a sense of... Um, security um i was guess i guess being like part of a religion your whole life you just you kind of like look for something else i mean like having nothing felt pretty empty so i was searching around for some meaning and stuff and um so yeah i i mean i used to still be part of the community a bit like just but not on the level I used to, um, like doing church activities or anything. But what happened, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Were you um, looking for a, a sense of belonging, a sense of security? Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I just had made the intention to explore other religions. So that was more um, my goal. I didn't know if I would be joining anymore. I just wanted to have more rounded perspective on you know life I suppose yes and I am so glad that you got out um 
before anything, you know, worse could happen. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, thanks, me too. And also, also, also one, one more thing. Sahara, we need more educators like you. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. Um, so we've got a comment here from Hamid. He had to leave, but he just wanted to say, um, thank you for your wonderful work. And thank you, Doug, for sharing your amazing story. Um, yeah. So he just didn't have a chance to say that, but he wanted you to know. And Amy, you're next. Hi. Uh, Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Um, I'm trying to support a, a woman here in Victoria who's going through a similar process. And so I'm curious to know about your status. I mean, she's fighting for custody. He yeah. says he's going to destroy her. And I think yeah. he might. I think he might. She's. Ah, uh, no, I'm hearing the same things too. So she's. Well, he seems to always be a step ahead of her in the evil department. Um, he. She's trying to get custody. Um, so, and she's physically afraid yeah Um, and so I'm curious to know about your status like how long has this been going on do you have all your kids right now how old are they you know what's happening so this is four years I've been going for custody now uh things have just been dragged on um I have three of my kids um so my oldest um after a year my oldest gave in to pressure by him and went and lived with him for two years, but then came back. And then at the same time, my other old, like my second oldest went and moved with him and is currently there. How but old seems they? like, so the oldest two are 15 and 14. And then I have a 10 year old and an eight year old. So um, the 14 year old currently with him, but seems like, you know, possibly, possibly will come back as well. But um, just this process where in the courts, he's granted access to his children as a father, but trying to make the courts understand what this access looks like for the kids. It's really, really hard on the kids. I mean, they're going back to the immense pressure that he puts on them and basically punishing them for what I'm doing almost, right? Like trying to make up for the evil stuff that I'm teaching them. So it's, he can't help but threaten me. I, I know from his point of view, when I think of what I look like from his point of view, like I'm like the most evil, horrible person in the world, taking his kids away from Islam. Um, I'm, they're all gonna go to hell now. So like, this is like his perspective of things and the way he's desperately trying to keep the kids and have them under his authority so that they will be good Muslims and end up in heaven with him. So it's like this crazy fundamental, fundamental uh, battle for him to get the kids. And for me, I am fighting for the kids to have the freedom to like, if they want to be with their dad, they can, but like, if they don't want to do give them that freedom. That's all I'm fighting for. And the courts completely see that, but it's because it's been in the courts for this long that they can really see the process and what it's doing to the kids and myself getting a restraining order help for this woman if she can try to manage to get one and you can do that by like there's ways you can um you tell him to stop contacting you and if he continues you show that to the police and they will throw one on him so like there's many things you can do every time you feel scared of him call the police every time like just get the police on his butt like constantly 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 they're here for women this country is here for the woman and these men when they talk to you and when he would talk to me like my ex he he make he makes you forget that fact and Mm -hmm. then you feel like they have all the power and i understand fully what she's going through but she needs to understand that she has the power and everyone will back her up well unfortunately this guy is really high up in the only mosque in town and so he sends other people to her door you know you can still even when people would do that to me like i still got him in trouble like if you if you would call the police for every single thing uh-huh. They will go, the police will question these people and then find out if he sent them. And like, it will, like, the, these kind of things, you just like call the police, like harass, 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 because he's harassing her. 
and yeah. he will get they will get her off like him off her butt like this is like there's these little things that I'm learning along the way that like you know these guys think they can just like impose what they want but like they really can't like if you if you don't want it you can stop them and you will have people behind you huh yeah I don't think she understands that I don't yeah that's interesting hmm. yeah. Yes, I'm serious. Yeah, tell her. Like, she has all the power. She needs to put her foot down. This is, I'm just learning this too. Like, well, once her I daughter, put her foot yeah. Down, yeah. She has to be prepared, I guess, to, for her daughter to go and live with him. Are you worried that he will marry your kids all? Oh, yeah. That's one of the reasons I left when I did, because my daughters were getting older and he wanted them. He expressed that he wanted them married off young because. He said when girls marry young, they are a lot more dedicated to their husbands for their for life. You know, he saw the psychological benefits of it. So um, I knew he would try to marry them off young. He wanted us to be in the Middle East by now, so they would probably be married by now if we had gone. How strange as a father. Sorry, Amy, I'm just going to jump in here for a second. It's just such a strange statement for a father to make where he's looking out for some random man and so he wants his child to be you know malleable and abused at a young age so that she can be easier to control by some yeah. random guy like you're you're looking out are you supposed to be looking out for your daughter or are you just looking out for some other man out there? Like, it's, it, what a weird fucked up mindset to say well, don't, yes. something like don't that. You think it's, don't you think it's just about power? I mean, my sense is that this man here doesn't care about anything. I think he's a sociopath, but he cares yeah. about winning and power. Yeah, control. And the daughter is a non-entity. He'll, he'll fall all over her if it means that he can destroy the mom and gets what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Aaliyah, did you have another question or is your hand just still up? You did have another one. Okay. Okay. Um, so since we're speaking about marriage, I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that one of your children, they identify with the, they belong to the LGBT community. Yeah. Is he aware of that? Yes. And um, he's very outspoken about his views on that. And he tells the kids what his views are on that. Um, so, yeah, so my oldest who is identifying as that is very much avoiding their dad and um, very resentful, obviously, of their dad. So, yeah, she hasn't spoken to him in over a year now and he's trying very hard to get access and he's trying to force access through the courts but he won't get it because she's almost 16 and but um yeah it's just it's really hard i can't imagine like having a father like him and being lgbt like it'd just be like being in iran and trying to be lgbt right it's like that type of you have to learn how to suppress that or just look at yourself in a horrible way. I don't know. But yeah, it, it, it's good though. The, the systems here to protect us from him because the system protects us from that. So. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is, um, I think I mentioned this in my story too, that a lot of these people who are, who do fall into the extremist bracket they hate the West. They actually do. They hate Western values, oh, they yeah. hate culture, they hate the freedoms, yet they want to be here. Yeah. Yet they want, yeah, they want to be here. And if I say that they want to be here to make money for a better life and for everything, then, you know, I'm called at, out as, oh, oh my God, you are racist. You know, yeah. these kind of thoughts about well, you know, those are the those are the better people. The better people are here because they want to exploit the you know the social services or yeah. the education or the yeah. medical benefits and all that stuff. Yeah. The worst people are the ones that are here because they want to do dawa because they want to spread Islam. That too. So, yeah. yeah. But both but both want to keep that Islamic culture 
here in the West and they want to expand it because I have seen a lot of mosques, you know, just there's so many mosques being, being built and everybody's just getting more and more and more religious people who wouldn't wear the hijab in the early 90s are wearing the abaya are wearing the hijab it's it's almost become as like a statement you know and yeah. it's so it's so appalling to see these women walking around fully covered and they're like oh we're so free yeah that's the whole thing you're just saying the opposite of what you're doing like if you're just sitting in a jail saying i'm the free one you're not like <laughs> you're just yeah how are you free so when weird. when if you take that off you know, you are the unripe candy or the, or the piece of melon or whatever it is that, that they say, you know? Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. I, 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 on a very hot day, I had my sleeves rolled up um, and my ex caught me, had my forearm showing and he lectured me for two days oh, fuck. that like, he couldn't believe that I thought it was okay to show my arms in public. Like he was just blown away that my brain like let that happen so it's like this indoctrination like you know she, like you she had a boob out like, or something she, well that's basically what he says he goes like you may as well be out topless like that's the same thing yeah really really scary you know i grew up in the 90s here in the united states half sleeves were were okay but only in the pakistani dress not in western in western oh. attire t-shirts no half sleeves nothing because those are the clothes of the devil you know mm -hmm. the west so in pakistani clothes half sleeves were fine but now it's scary because now everybody has you know like it keeps moving further 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 now you know it was quarter sleeves it, it moved to quarter sleeves and now people wear full sleeves like yeah. completely so it's just seeing all this here in the west is just terrifying for me how these people are able to where do we go? Where do people like yeah. us go? Where's yeah. You know? yeah. That's crazy. Thank you. You're welcome. Mars, you're next. Thank you, Yasmin. Hi, Deborah. Hey. The 9-11 just passed, and it was really depressing to me to see that, you know, on social media we have a lot of individuals just posting a lot of sanctimonious posts about how oh no one understands Islam and that was just something else to see. Um, but what I wanted to ask you was that you you you're a Caucasian and you don't look what I think most people think of as the stereotypical Muslim today. And a, a lot of people want to put the kibosh on the discussion regarding Islam because of the old Is Islamophobic sphere. I wanted to ask you, like, when you, do you ever have conversations with people and when the, does a topic ever arise regarding Islam and you tell them you're a Muslim and do, do you see some kind of like their face changes to realize they're talking to someone who's of another, who's of an unexpected ethnicity, who's a part of the religion? How, 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 what's, what's their reaction to that? Like if I told them I am a Muslim or was a Muslim? Yeah, yeah. That I was a Muslim? Yeah. Um, I my mean, exa my yeah. example of that would be like, you know, like being Asian, like if I told someone that I was a Buddhist, people would probably like wouldn't have too much cognitive dissonance with that. But right. since you're Caucasian, yeah. and you identify as a Muslim. Yeah, yeah. The, do you see steam coming out of their ears with this kind of. Oh, yeah. Thing? Sometimes. Um, yeah, it would be either this like immense, like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, really, like this praise like this is like the most amazing thing I've ever seen or what the hell is going on here and be like really upset with what I'm doing and like how could you you know betray your country and join that um because I looked quite extreme the way I dressed and um so I mean yeah it was like it was either one like it was like one or the other it was like amazement or like I mean I was told that like if I went you know they wanted to take me back home to their country so that they could charge money for people to come and look at the white skin like that kind of reaction you know but um some people didn't trust me 
even, like being a white convert to Islam. Um, they thought I didn't know what I was doing and I just did it to get married. But um, yeah, it was, I went down the road of white guilt for like the last few years. Um, uh, you know, the white guilt and hating colonialism and all that. And I even felt like I had white privilege as a white Muslim. So I was like recognizing that kind of privilege I was enjoying. So, yeah, it, I don't know if that answers your question. More or less, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Erkan, last but not least, and then we'll we'll wrap it up with, unless somebody who hasn't spoken, has there, Masha, you haven't said anything, but we'll we'll, uh, we'll let you go now, Erkan, and then hopefully anybody else who has anything to say can uh, can raise okay, their hand. Yeah. Sorry if I'm being greedy, but I just I was no. thinking about um, um, some people uh, going back to Sahara's point about education, and you're an edu I'm an educator too, and um, this troubles me a lot. You know this kind of um, well, the kind of issues that we've been talking about, education, morality, um, and all of these kinds of issues. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, like, to what extent, it's interesting to, it's hard to prove, but um, to what extent does the ideology um, produce that sense of hubris and power? And, you know, it does seem to me that there's a kind of disproportionate sense of kind of arrogance among, you know, this kind of, this way of thinking and I wonder I think it's to do with the totalizing and totalitarian nature of Islam you know and the, you know Muslims think it's the inerrant word of God it's the perfect word of God it's unalterable and all these kind of it came from heaven straight from heaven into Muhammad's hand and you know um so I, I think it's interesting to ask those kinds of questions I don't think we're out of place to to pose those kinds of questions you know like that sense of that arrogance, you know, that kind of arrogance that comes with it. I mean, Supremacy. If I can just, yeah, like, so in the introduction to the Oxford World Classics version of the Quran, my, my book, um, it says, it is, it is the book that differentiates between right and wrong, so that nowadays, when the Muslim world is dealing with such universal issues as globalization, the environment, what? Um, you know, and, and it says when the Muslim, yeah, the environment, combating terrorism and drugs, issues of medical ethics and feminism, evidence to support the various arguments is sought in the Quran. So that gives you an indication of the totalizing nature of this religion. And that comes from a respected, that comes from a respected scholar of Islam, Abdel Halim, and he's an Egyptian. And, um, without any sense of irony, you know, he mentions these 21st century issues. Now, according to my reading of the Quran, I didn't read any of those issues addressed in the way that a 21st century human being would look for, you know, in the way that we would, you know, environmental science. Is that in the Quran, really? I don't think so. You know, drugs and, yeah, I, I just, I wonder, you know, it's just it's special pleading, right? And they, they use the Quran to, to they draw on, this is, this is the thing about um, interpretation. Every book is open to interpretation and every book is fallible and the Quran is no different, right? I mean, this is the thing. And sorry if any Muslims are watching this on YouTube. And, you know, this is not a sign of my disrespect, by the way. I've got lots of notes in this. Holy you can God. disrespect it's it actually, all you want. You don't need to apologize. Yeah, but yeah. No, but it's, it's, it's a sign of actually, no, but I would counter that by saying it's a sign of respect because- well, Look how I'm much you're studying it. Um, Good I am for you. Critically, critically engaging with the text, which is respect, you know? So That's anyone who's anyway. watching this, think twice before you label me. Anyway. So yeah, I just think, I, I don't think it's, I just wanted to just say that. I don't think it's, I don't think it's ridiculous to to argue that you know um, you know because obviously these accusations are made all the time you know people you don't understand the Quran well you know I've read it right well then of course they say um, well you didn't read it in Arabic right so then you don't really understand it you know and that kind of thing so they've always got an answer yeah, for everything there always be that 
even Arabic speaking, like, what do you, what do you get, Yasmin, when uh, they tell you you don't understand it, even though you speak Arabic? Like, she'll have some other, you never were, were a real Muslim or something like that. Like, there'll always be a reason why, or Allah didn't show you the truth. Exactly. Like you don't have the faith in your heart or you don't have the yeah. light in your mind. So yeah. that's why you're not love... able to read it the the right way or whatever. But I've said yeah. this before and I, and I just want to say it again very clearly that the translation of the Quran is completely whitewashed. They declaw it so much in the translation. Um, when you read it in Arabic, it is so much worse. It is so much more harsh and drastic and violent and disgusting. And people read it in English and they're surprised. And I'm like, you don't even know. This is them choosing their words so carefully when they were translating this because they knew that it was gonna be a Western audience that were gonna be reading it and critiquing it much like you're doing now in Um but anyway, Deb, I'll let you I'll let you respond to to what Arkham was saying. Um, I'm not sure how to respond or what to was right. there a question in there or um, I think he was got I think it was about the Islamic supremacy in general. Um, and I do agree with what you were saying, and that is correct. And that's something that Muslims say unapologetically that Islam is not just a religion, it's a way of life. So it, they yeah. they they agree that it's totalitarianism. And that's not said with any sort of, you know, remorse or apology. It's, it's, this is the truth. Every oh, yeah. single, I mean, my mom used to say to me, I could I just eat that. She used to say to me with pride, like, um, you know, all of these other non-Muslims, they have to read all of these books and all of these libraries. They have to do so much research. They, we have all the answers in one book. So it was, they are proud of having such small minds and of having such a teeny tiny perspective that is 1400 years old. They're not interested in anything to do with feminism or um, the environment or anything to do with anything more recent than, you know, 1400 years ago. So yeah, like everything you said is true and believing Muslims, honest believing Muslims will express that to you honestly. But you, what you what you have, there are a lot of people that are born and raised in the West who know how to speak with a forked tongue and they know what to say to you and what not to say to you and what to um, uh, what to admit to and what not to admit to. So, you know, it, it's very different when you speak to Muslim people from the Muslim world who don't know to play those games. They will, they will very clearly tell you, yes, it is, uh, Islamic supremacy is a thing. They do really believe that they truly are better than everybody else. Um, Muslims, this is, you know, there's things in the religion that express that so clearly, like when you look at slavery, Muslims can never be slaves. Only non-Muslims can be slaves. And the reason is because Muslims are held on a different pedestal. And that even comes from hijab as well. Muslim women wear hijab because they are to be covered and protected. Non-Muslim women, you can rape them if you want. They, they're different. So there's that whole Islamic supremacy is, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's unapologetic. So everything that you found to be true and you just couldn't believe it, um, yeah, it's all true. Yeah, definitely. So Deb, I just wanted to give you the last word before we we uh, we say goodbye to everyone. Did we touch on everything that you wanted to touch on? Was there a, a piece of advice that you had for everybody or um, anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap up? Um, I guess, just um i just appreciate that you're doing this um the more the merrier i'm really excited about you know being a voice in this cause um i see i mean it almost destroyed my life this uh ideology um it scares me that so many people know so little about it still like after going through it i just you know, you just assume everyone knows, but when you think, when you talk to people, like really people, 
nobody knows. Um, just trying to get the word out there without, you know, being shut down as a racist Islamophobe. Um, addressing uh, extreme Islam uh, is very important and empowering women. Again, like this other woman that uh, we were talking about who's going through the same thing. Um, just this year, I've re-empowered myself with uh, the help of other women that have gone through what I'm going through um, to stand your ground and the system will back you. And I, I was shocked, like even just now, like I, my ex is trying to force my youngest to go to Islamic school and he went to the school here to take him out of there and remove him and take him to like he was just he went back there like over and over to do it so I'm like fighting this and putting my foot down and like doing things that I would think I would get in trouble for but everyone has my back because they just want to protect the kids so no matter how scary like he has thrown all kinds of accusations and threats and bullied me and things that are completely baseless and that he can never follow through on. So these guys will, they, they've they been in control the whole marriage. Uh, so they just, they can't fathom that, you know, you're not going to do what they want now. So that, um, you know, we have way more power than we think especially coming from an abusive situation and just to always remind yourself of that um that's very important and if you do know somebody who is in it is in it currently like i was stay close by even if they seem like they're not listening to you just be close so that if they come to their senses one day or something happens they have you to run to um i'm just so thankful my parents always stayed close by and they even though they disagreed, they still always supported and helped me. And I went to them and they helped me out when I needed it. So I know a lot of um, people that convert, a lot of their families disown them. And I think that's the wrong thing because you, they need to be there for when they, they, they need somewhere to run to get away. And, and they, that will be a point that they come to. So that's my advice that I have. So thank you for having me. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Deb, for all that great advice. And thank you all for joining us. And um, yeah, just one last final thank you so much, Deb, for sharing your story with us and for being so honest and forthright. And you are a wonderful human being. And I'm so grateful to know you. And everybody thank here you. is now grateful to know you as well. Yeah, me too. All right. Nice Take care, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.